Kirby Planet Robobot has become one of my favorite Kirby games. There are various reasons for that. The great levels, the great music, the many, many callbacks to past Kirby games. But it is also one of the most cinematic Kirby games. Look at the introduction to this alien laboratory, so stylish. The Kirby series has dabbled with rather elaborate cutscenes before, true, but Kirby's return to Dreamland and Triple Deluxe largely threw them out in favor of a Kirby's Adventure-style experience. So it's nice to see a cinematic story return in Planet Robobot. But what is this story about? Capitalism is bad. That's what. Needless to say, Kirby has been pro-socialism or maybe social anarchism since the very beginning. The original Kirby's Dreamland depicts Kirby fighting the elites who have hoarded the food to themselves instead of equitably distributing it, leaving thousands to starve. The ending features Kirby literally throwing the ruler out of his castle, which he then carries to the people as food rains down that they may enjoy the rightful fruits of their labor. Spoilers for Planet Robobot ahead here, folks. If you don't want spoilers, then... You probably shouldn't have clicked on this video. Aliens attack Kirby's idyllic homeworld pop star, largely full of wilderness and ruins and, presumably, pre-industrial societies with barter-based or only proto-capitalist economies. The invaders, as Kirby eventually learns, are all part of the Haltman Works Company. The plot is largely concerned with Kirby learning more about the company as he removes the legs of its access arc from various regions of pop star. This corporation travels the galaxy in a planet-sized starship, the Access Arc, visiting different planets to systematically strip them of their resources. Their mother computer assimilates the inhabitants to use as a slave labor force and apparently takes any valuable scientific knowledge they might possess to put towards the interests of the company. You know, like the Borg. Throughout Planet Robobot, the main face of the company is Susie. She is slavishly devoted to the company and, presumably, her salary. When Kirby first meets her, Susie explains that Popstar is rich in resources and tells him that his people are foolish for not using them. And because they won't use them, they are to be exterminated. Because the Popstarians... er... Uh, Popstarites? Uh, because Kirby's people aren't using their land in a way that the galactic elite consider productive, they'll just take it for themselves, the people be damned. All that's missing from this portrait of neocolonialism is some pretext. The head of the company is a man named Max Profit Haltman. Get it? Because he only cares about maximizing profits! Even if that means destroying vibrant ecosystems and killing billions of people. This sociopathic self-interest is the inevitable end to which capitalist thinking leads. But the Haltman Works Company is obviously not just out for genocide. The invaders establish hegemony over Popstar, which stands in, metaphorically, as a developing country. First, they take out the local major political figures, represented by Meta Knight and King Dedede in his impotent attempt to defend his country. Note that King Dedede is already a corrupt ruler, wasting his time with trivial pursuits like chess instead of politics. The people of his country do not respect his authority. Dedede was originally propped up at all because he received support from another evil interstellar corporation, as seen in the Kirby anime. Come to think of it, the anime has a really similar plot. Even down to Poo 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 Land is a developing country. Uh, anyway. Kirby visits the invaders' huge cities, their shipping yards on the coast, and even the oil fields they've constructed in a drained ocean. That looks like oil to me. As for why the oils in what appear to be giant blenders, or why there are, like, giant forks with spaghetti wrapped around them. I don't know, but I'm sure it means something. The first boss in Kirby tradition is Wispy Woods, but he has been so roboticized that he is virtually unrecognizable. Instead of a representation of the forest, Haltman has transformed him into a ruthless killing machine. We even see Waddle Dees fleeing the so-called clanky woods, presumably because they are among those who would not buy into Haltman's hegemony. This symbolizes the absolute annihilation and perversion of nature in service to the capitalist system, which cannot fail to exploit the environment to the point of utter ruin. In one of Planet Robobot's most haunting moments, Wispy weeps tears of oil. 
he cries not only for his failure to defeat Kirby, but because he recognizes the perverse mockery of himself that he has become. Wispy's innocence is lost. He will never be the tree he once was. The horror is underscored by Kirby, who remains so innocent that he still executes his victory dance. Planet Robobot very subtly shows the exploitation of the Popstarians. Initially, the enemies Kirby faces in Patched Plains are Waddle Dees, Bronto Burts, and other series mainstays. But the Waddle Dees are wearing construction helmets and piloting mech suits. They are clearly depicted as construction workers and soldiers on the invaders' behalf. This is the true face of capitalism. The invaders, the capitalists, do the smallest amount of work but reap all the profits. Because Haltman only cares about max profits. Seriously, I don't think we see any of the invaders doing any work throughout the game. Some of them appear in Gigabyte Grounds as presumably overseers, though. They carry whips, suggesting that the capitalists are slave drivers. But as Kirby moves deeper into Holtman's capitalist dystopia hellscape, the Waddle Dees and other enemies begin displaying cybernetic modifications. Obviously, this is a reference to Charlie Chaplin's famous speech in the closing of his film The Great Dictator, in which he describes how fascism has come about because capitalism is turning people into unfeeling machines. Here, the metaphor is presented graphically. After exploiting their labor, the company is literally transforming the working class into machines, their individualism destroyed, their unthinking bodies completely subservient to the system. Wait, the anime already did this, too. Um, I'll need to slip the mask off for a bit. I realized after I coughed up this script that in his video Serious Sonic Lore Analysis, H. Bomber Guy made comparisons to the same exact Chaplin films I'd do, and that video is already similar in concept to this one, except that I'm a little more serious. So I was going to cut this part out, but then I realized that this scene from that episode of the Kirby anime is completely an homage to modern times. Look at this. It's the same scene, except played for suspense instead of comedy. And that episode is thematically almost identical to Planet Robobot. Capitalism turns people into thoughtless slaves and destroys the environment in exchange for short-term benefits, really servicing only the elites. Look at this extremely subtle symbolism. It means capitalism is shit. I'm sorry if this makes me look like a copycat, even if almost nobody will see this video, probably. The point is, maybe Chaplin is hugely influential to the Kirby franchise. The horror is this. The assimilated people are presumably still aware, but their bodies are no longer their own. This Waddle Dee can only watch a numb whore screaming internally as he is forced to march to his death against Kirby. Maybe this Waddle Dee loved Kirby. Kirby was his personal hero when he was still allowed to express his individuality, when it had not been taken from him through a daily grind. Kirby is witnessing the complete absorption of the individual to the interests of the capitalists. The genius here is that this is simply shown to the player, who is left to interpret the implications on their own. Planet Robobot doesn't lecture us about the loss of individuality. It lets us witness it, the terror of the apocalyptic dystopia speaking for itself. The entire story builds up to Kirby's confrontation with the madman at the heart of this system of death and slavery. Max Holtman. Holtman can be taken as the emblematic capitalist, sociopathically killing undeveloped populations and destroying the environment of whole planets in the blind pursuit of short-term profit. While the guys at the bottom are doing all the work, Holtman sits at the top with a mech suit made of solid gold and studded with diamonds. Note the images of Holtman plastered throughout the Access arc. Susie sings a hymn in his praise. Holtman and, in turn, capitalism are false gods. Holtman also displays tones of neocolonialist racism when he is thrown into a rage at the thought of the savages of Popstar resisting him. Note another reference to genocide. But there is only one savage here, and he's wearing a suit. Initially, Holtman attempts to intimidate Kirby by showing him the mother computer, once again displaying his condescending attitude towards the Popstarians. 
When this fails, Holtman drops the veneer of politeness and tries to murder Kirby outright, cackling and screaming like a lunatic. This is what the capitalist really is, beneath all his gold and fancy clothes. A murderous brute. Holtman literally throws wads of money to obstruct the player's view. Another powerful metaphor. Money clouds our perception of the world, just as it clouded Holtman's. Because, as the flavor text in Meta Nightmare Returns reveals, Holtman was not always the monster he is today. In the past, when Holtman was first experimenting with the mother computer, an experiment went wrong. His daughter Susanna Patria Holtman was warped into another dimension. Patria? 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 The katakana on the Kirby wiki looks like they say Famira. Maybe Pamela? So, who knows? Afterwards, Holtman fell into a deep depression, but found the will to live through devoting himself wholly to his company. I mean, probably. What else is the implication of this single screen of text? His daughter did eventually return, however. Kirby met her. She is Susie. But Holtman no longer recognized her, and she had no desire to be reunited with him. According to Satoshi Ishida, this is because interfacing with the mother computer over the years gradually eroded Holtman's memories. On an interpretive level, this probably relates to capitalism somehow. Like, he dedicated himself to his company until he saw nothing but the company's good. Like, he put more value on that than familial love. Both Max and Susie were too deep in the selfish inhumanity prerequisite to the capitalist system. Max didn't know his own daughter, and Susie only wanted to get close enough to steal the controls of the mother computer to sell to another company. Her fawning praise of Holtman throughout the game, singing songs in his praise and whatnot. Mere acting. Susie, too, is perfectly willing to abandon all dignity and decency in the pursuit of Max Profit. She and Max are two sides of the same coin. Get it? Coin? Because... greed? <laughs> Seriously, look, one of the music tracks associated with Susie is called The Secretary That Forgot Love. When Susie betrays Holtman, her own father, she kills him. Wow, this is really dark. Um, what... What was this series again? Without the helmet that lets him interface with the mother computer, the computer plugs directly into Holtman's body. Soon it deletes his soul and replaces it with his own OS, his body serving as nothing but a mouth for the machine. Now Holtman, the exploiter himself, has been exploited, turned into a machine, but because he was so obsessed with profit, blind to love and basic decency, he was already dead long ago. The computer takes Max's obsession with efficiency for the company to its logical extreme, deciding that it must completely eliminate organic life. You see, the company does not exist for the good of people, it exists for the good of itself. Admittedly, at this point, it's the corporation rather than capitalism that is evil, but the classist, bureaucratic, top-down corporation is the inevitable real-world result of capitalism. After a long battle, Kirby takes out the mother computer and the Holtman Works Company and Holtman's corpse with them. Thus, the working class ultimately triumphs over the capitalists, although Planet Robobot posits the depressing scenario that the capitalists cannot be overthrown. Rather, they will destroy themselves in a massive catastrophe that the working class Kirby must clean up. And what happens to Popstar next? How can Kirby's world ever recover from the wounds inflicted upon it? The environment is destroyed and so many of the series' regulars have been warped beyond recognition. This is a victory, perhaps, but a heavy victory. Oh, wait, all the technology magically disappears. Well, what did you expect, Mother 3? This is a Kirby game, like, it's goofy and evil loses. But surely the trauma remains. 
In this preview for the next Kirby game, I'm sure that Wispy Woods is traumatized, and the way that he is attacking Kirby and his helpers here is symbolic of his PTSD. Social anarchy gives us idyllic fields, social harmony, and happiness. Its triumph is depicted as causing the evils of capitalism to literally vanish. The people are free. In contrast, capitalism divides families, ravages the environment, and extirpates the individual. The capitalists' responsibility is not the good of humanity, or even the good of themselves, but only the profits in the ledgers. The pursuit of max profit transforms people into machines, and if the system is not stopped, there will be nothing left but machines, because before all life has been annihilated, these thoughtless automatons will be us. Okay, let me be serious for a moment. Some of the points I make overreach so much it's funny. At least I hope so. I think it's funny. But a lot of the other elements I analyze are deliberate, if probably not actually meant as a criticism of capitalism itself. A Kirby game with serious themes was so weird, and I was thinking about them the whole time I played the game. I felt the need to express my observations on the subject somewhere. Combined with the many intriguing references to older Kirby games, I thought it made Planet Robobot truly fascinating. Thank you, Shinya Kumazaki, and the many others who created Kirby Planet Robobot. It's not perfect, but nonetheless, a jewel in the 3DS library. Perhaps you're thinking, this is just Kirby. Why read so much into it? There are two reasons. The first is that this subtext is clearly there. It's not even subtext, just text. The second reason is because there's a, a um, 